Alrighty. Um, th uh, thank you to Greg for the invitation to come today. Um, I'm here to present a paper uh, with my colleague or, or co-author, Ted Lenz, who's going to do the second half of the presentation, He's a doctoral student in our program. And we're going to talk about the, uh, the national trends in uh, serious violence, firearm victimization, and homicide to the extent that we are able to do so using the data that exists. And then we um, have a second component of the paper which focuses on the same types of trends in the city of St. Louis, and that's the section that uh, Ted will discuss. So, oops. So here's, uh, here's the purpose of our paper. We, we were asked to um, consider what uh, factors that might have been associated with the increases in homicide between 2014 and 2016 in the United States. They were notable. There were uh, um, a lot more deaths um, in 2016 than there were in 2014, reversing a, a trend. And so we were asked to consider what role firearms um, might have been playing in that. And the way we approached the issue was to uh, think about the problem in three ways. The increases in homicide uh, may be a result of a growth of the, in the number of violent incidents at large, and that is, of course, a function of the number of violent people and the number of incidents that they're committing. We don't have indicators of the number of violent people. We have in, in, um, indicators of the number of violent incidents, though, that exist. We then ask, in, has, did something change in the proportion of violent incidents involving homicide between 2014 and 2016? And then we ask whether or not the lethality of, whether we have any indicators as to whether the lethality of those violent incidents involving firearms may have changed over time. So those are the focuses of our national trend and our uh, local trend analysis. Um, so we're going to use multiple sources of data from the police, from victim, sur victim surveys and other sources, as well as uh, CDC we've taken a look at. And then in the city of St. Louis, because those other data sources aren't available there, we rely on uh, police-based data. And I want to make the point that, um, there, that all data that exist on firearm violence are incomplete. And a lot of these are not about a lot of the problems that we're doing, with, uh, we're running into with basic uh, descriptive analyses to get started on our research questions are about data limitations, not about statistical modeling questions, um, just in my, in my personal uh, experience. Um, um, well, I don't know why it's double counting. But anyway, uh, Erica, fortunately for me, had already gone over some of the existing uh, data sources on firearm violence. We have what's collected by the police in the Uniform Crime Report system, um, and we, we've seen some stuff mostly with the supplementary homicide reports <coughs> today, which does, which does, of course, have the homicide incidents and details, including uh, gun use. And we have the NIBR system, which is being phased in, coming up in 2021. Um, and um, that will have a lot more detail or a lot more capacity to provide information on gun presence in um, violent incidents. That said, though, uh, not to dismiss that, but we need refinements in that in terms of what, how it is guns are used. This is true in the NCVS as well. The gun presence data is just gun presence data. And in the victims survey data, there is, there is a question asked about whether they were shot or injured by the weapon. But we don't really know, for example, if these are shots fired in the air, if these are guns brandished, if they're just pulled and put in front of somebody's face, if they're shots and misses. We don't know any of those kinds of details that I think most of the gun violence researchers would want from our national indicators. The National Crime Victimization Survey, fortunately, was already discussed. Okay, so let me um, say why um, the paper that we've done is, is kind of the first to look at this issue, revisit this issue in a long time, and that's because of Professor Cook um, in the room. He had an a extremely important paper published uh, back uh, more than 30 years ago, and in that, he found that the precursor to the survey data, the NCS, appeared to estimate or under, only about a third of gunshot victims when you compare the survey data um, to other sources of data. and. Um, he backed that estimate out using police data fatality rates as a comparison and found that the, um, the, the differences in the fatality estimates are what 
suggested that the NCS was underestimating the data. After ruling out um, kind of minor population coverage issues, he made two, two hypotheses that the undercounting may result from the unwillingness of persons shot, uh, especially during their own criminal behavior, or by persons known to them to report this information in an interview. Kind of makes sense, especially since it's a, a government agency doing the interviewing. And then there's also a, probably a more important problem, uh, and that is that the, there is an unwillingness of persons who are engaged in criminal behavior, probably a greater unwillingness, to participate in survey interviews. We know the largest correlation between uh, victimization is offending or prior victimization, and um, it's unlikely that we're capturing adequately, given the sample design, those um, persons. Um, what we did in our paper was find that over time, the, gun, the NCBS is still suggesting an undercount of about the same, roughly the same magnitude that Professor Cook found back in 1985 by, we compared our, uh, the 2003-2012 NCBS data to the, the emergency room data that he have. So the gunshot victim measure in the NCBS, we agree, is not reliable for assessing changes over time. That said, why is it twice? <laughs> that said, we believe that the NCBS data on firearm use in crime, the presence of a firearm in a victimization, is uh, reliable for studying trends because the data show uh, uh, comparable estimates to the UCR's estimates of uh, gun use and aggravated assault. The UCR, it's a misnomer to call it a census, um, the data that are in there. It is an estimation, and it is sometimes difficult to find out how those estimations are done by the agency. They're not a statistical agency. They have a process, and they work with it, and maybe it's working. And, and, but, we've, but here it shows, in the case of the uh, UCR uh, bi firearm violence rate, and the NCBS that they both show similar estimates and, and increases between 14 and 16, which was the topic of, of our analysis. I also want to make a, a, a slight point. Um, the reason we don't use the UCR to um, compare to homicide trends um, is that we believe the NCBS has, is going to give us a little bit more um, leverage and things to study than we can do in the summary system, but also just for, for general knowledge, the UCR data in, um, in the literature is not in trend on serious violence, not reliable from the 1970s through about the mid-1980s. It shows different trends than the homicide trend data do and than the NCBS do. So that's just a caution if you're going back in time and studying long-term trends with UCR in violence. So we're going to use the NCBS data, even though the gunshot victimizations are continually, uh, consistently underestimated over time, the gun use <clears throat> and the serious violence measures in the NCBS are uh, reliable. So in our analysis, we look at 93 to 2016. That's still the most recent year of available data um, to, to the public. Uh, for the NCBS due to the issues I've learned today that Erica pointed out, understaffed at the ACJD. And um, <clears throat> we looked at homicides and homicides committed with a firearm. And I'm just going to show you the homicide data quickly uh, and not focus on the firearm. The, the results are the same because most are firearm. Um, and then NCBS data, we're going to look at the trends in non-lethal serious violence, which includes those crime types there, serious violence committed with a firearm, and victimizations resulting in serious bodily injury as a proxy measure for whether or not, for whether people may be um, becoming um, more injurious in their intentions during a violence incident. There's, of course, no way to directly measure this. Uh, we look at lethality by comparing the proportions of, of all violent incidents that result in a homicide, and also by comparing the ratio of the rates between homicide and non-lethal violence. So here's the uh, long-term trends. At the top is, well, let me start, I don't know how 
here. This is the homicide rate, uh, the lower line from 93 to 16. The NCBS-based non-lethal serious violence rate, and this is the three-year smooth average, and the uh, dashed lines are the uh, raw rates. And then what you see in the top line then, using the metric on the right, is the number of homicides per 1,000 serious violent victimizations in the United States. So the homicide rate here is per 100,000, and non-lethal serious violence is per 1,000. And so what we see in this trend here is an increasing lethality or a change in the number of homicides per serious violent victimization from about five in 1993 to just over 10 now. This is because the non-lethal serious violence rate has decreased faster than the homicide rate and because the non-lethal serious violence rate did not change from 14 to 16, though the homicide rate uh, did go up some. When we ask the, whether or not victimizations are more likely to involve guns, as reported by the victims in the survey, now than they were in the past, we don't see any evidence of that. What we see is the gun victimizations and the non-gun serious violent victimizations declined and then remained stable at the same rate in the recent period. So the percent of non-lethal serious violence committed with a gun hasn't really changed. So we're seeing an increased number of homicides per incident, but not because there are more guns or greater presence of gun per incident. When we look at serious violence uh, with resulting in serious injury to the victim or not resulting in serious injury, and by serious injury I'm talking about broken bones, knife wounds, gun wounds, serious uh, rapes, and um, other uh, internal injuries. We see a small increase, though it's very small, from about 12% resulting in serious injury in the early 90s to about 16% in the more recent period. So there is a, a little bit of evidence that um, when there is a serious violent incident, it's more likely to result in serious injury, but it's just a small percentage. So that said, I'm going to switch this over to Ted to talk about what's happening in St. Louis. Um, and then we're going to come back and compare the national stories to the local story um, because it's different. <laughs> so the, the data for St. Louis uh, come from the uh, Metropolitan Police Department. Um, again, we have homicides and non-lethal serious violence. Non-lethal serious violence includes uh, robberies and aggravated assaults. And in the data, uh, there's several characteristics, um, including the date, location of the incident, as well as whether or not a firearm was used. Um, we have to truncate the trend to up to 2004 um, through actually 2018 because prior to 2004, the homicide data, which are um, the files actually stored separately from the uh, non-lethal data, the 60% of the cases or more, more than that um, were missing on whether or not a firearm was used. And so, um, then later on, we'll compare with some community characteristics when we look at the within city uh, trends. And those data come from the, the, the Census and the American Community Survey. And we use uh, an uh, area-based interpolation method to um, compare across the, the years. So the story looks somewhat similar to the national, um, to the national level in St. Louis with um, the black line here is the non-lethal serious violence rate and stays uh, fairly stable over time. But homicide, beginning in 2014, jumps fairly dramatically, which is why the lethality indicator, the number of homicides per 1,000 serious violent victimizations, goes up. Mm -hmm. What's interesting is that in St. Louis, um, 
the, this is the non-lethal violence rates, both with and without a gun. And then the dotted line is the percent of non-lethal violence with a gun. And so you can see that non-lethal incidents without a gun continue to um, decrease, but starting in 2014, they rise. Um, so, and, and with that, the percentage with a gun also rises. <coughs> Here's for homicide. Um, this is just to demonstrate that the percentage of homicides that involve a firearm is remarkably high in St. Louis. So in 2004, it was maybe as low as 80%, but in the more recent period, it's um, upwards of 95% of the homicides are committed with a firearm. So to look at the within city differences, um, here we compute the change in a number of indicators uh, between uh, the 2012-2013 um, pooled counts to the 2015-2016. So we're just looking at, uh, at how the changes uh, varied across the city. And on the left, we have the change in homicide. On the right, the, the change in non-lethal violence. And I've starred a track, um, these are census tracks, by the way. I've starred a track um, over there that we say is arguably the most dangerous track in St. Louis. And just to give you a sense of the, the level of violence, um, this is a 0.61 square mile area. So maybe four, four blocks or so. Um, on average, over the 2004 to 2016 period, they had 5.6 homicides annually. In 2016, uh, there were seven, which means that the homicide rate was about 140 per 100,000, compared to about six at the national level. Um, there were 106 gun victimizations here per year for a rate of 1,800 per 100,000, as opposed to about 160 per 100,000 at the national level. Um, so the population decreased a little bit from about 6,000 to around 5,000 people between 2000 and 2016. Um, and so that just gives you a sense of, of how violent some of these areas are um, in St. Louis. So you can see that the change in homicide was not, uh, it wasn't random across the city. It was concentrated in areas that normally um, show up as hot spots of violence uh, in the, the north, northwest, and then a little bit down um, here in the southeast. Uh, the change in non-lethal violence was somewhat similar, but a little bit different as well. Um, it's a little bit more dispersed, uh, which could be an artifact of uh, the, rare, the rarity of homicide, which um, concentrates it a little bit more. Here's the, the change in gun violence and the change in lethality. So the other two indicators that we looked at over time. Um, you can see still the, the change in gun violence um, is th there's larger increases in the north, uh, especially the northwest parts of the city, and down in the southeast there's a, another pocket. <clears throat> so as a sort of a first order question is, are there community characteristics that are typically correlated with um, violence? Do they, can they account for uh, the changes that we see? So what we did was we split um, all the census tracts into quartiles based on the change in the homicide rate between uh, the 2012-2013 to 2015-2016, and then just look at how the average, um, the average tract changed over time w w across those quartiles. So what you'll see is that by and large, over this relatively short period of time, when you consider uh, community change, that the, the, red, the red line is the top homicide quartile. So that's where the increases in homicide were greatest. And you can see that, with maybe an exception of the percent vacant units, um, none of the other community characteristics uh, can really account for the abrupt change in homicide. However, um, where the largest increases in homicide occurred 
do seem to be associated with um, the, le the, the community characteristics because it was concentrated in places that are higher in poverty, um, greater percentage of African-American black population, um, et cetera. So again, the, the, cha the community changes aren't really associated with the changes in homicide, but where the, the greatest increases were in homicide are associated with um, these characteristics. So to summarize our, our, our main findings, um, the 2014 and 2016 homicide increase, uh, it wasn't really accompanied, at least at the national level, by comparable increases in these possible um, explanations that we outlined in the beginning. Um, there weren't comparable increases in non-lethal serious violence or non-lethal violence committed with a gun um, or serious bodily injury. Um, so we speculate a little bit that um, perhaps it has something to do with increased lethal capacity of guns um, over time, uh, maybe something to do with intent, but again, it's a, it's a data issue. Uh, um, measuring it uh, uh, is very difficult. So at the local level, um, the higher levels, uh, there, there were much higher levels of gun use and lethality in St. Louis. It's always at the top of the list um, across all the violence indicators. And um, it's spatially concentrated, though, in certain areas of the city. And the, we find that the changes in the structural characteristics and population composition that are typically associated with um, violence don't seem to um, account for the large increases in homicide that uh, we saw. Um, <clears throat> again, long-term increases uh, in lethality and the lethal capacity of firearms may be resulting from um, a greater number of deaths when something like exogenous shocks, which um, we're speculating about here, we, we don't have any, um, for instance, Rick talked about uh, drug markets, potentially maybe that could um, act as a type of exogenous shock, and some communities within St. Louis may have been more susceptible to those types of things. But again, it's just speculation. Um, it's probably a data problem. We don't have data on some of these underlying mechanisms that are driving these overall trends. So, so we want to uh, make the point that um, you know we're. This is related to uh, Rick Rosenfeld's paper and, and kind of the purpose of probably a lot of firearm research is that you know we want to find out you know why is it that peop more people might be ending up dead, um, and so um, we've taken what we think the national level data as far as it can go. Um, at this point for getting at this issue, but there is more capacity within city data systems, like what Chicago has probably got is um, extraordinary. I know St. Louis has some of that, and but whether it's being used uh, by police to actually do something is another, is another question altogether. Um, the, but what our argument here is that this, this is a long-term increase in lethal capacity of firearms. That we know is true. Um, from gun research, and it doesn't, you don't have to have more guns to have more deaths given the number of bullets uh, that are fired, may be fired for instance, those are the kinds of things that I would want to know next as a researcher. Whether or not we could get out the number of, of casings per incident, some of the uh, casing scenes in St. Louis are extraordinary. Um, and whether or not the caliber, of the, whether or not there's been an increase in the caliber of bullets on the street that, that um, has led to this long-term increase in lethality. So there's, there's good news here is that it doesn't appear in the data to us that peop, there are more violent people. What it appears is there's been a gradual increase in the instrumentality power of firearms so that when an exogenous shock happens to cause a spike increase, it has a, a stronger magnitude now than it did in the days of rifles and 22s. Um, I know Phil Cook has a recent paper on this. Um, sorry, I can't remember. He cited in there, but I can't remember which about the um, caliber and fatality um, from Boston, I believe. Right. 
from last year in JAMA. Uh, right. And so they found that, you know, it's, you can't, it doesn't appear that those who are using, that the offenders who are using the high caliber bullets are any better shots or any, any more skilled in your findings. It appears that they're just more likely to end up dead. And if more offenders, not more offenders, um, if the offenders that are out there are carrying more higher instrument um, guns, then we'll have more deaths when things like drug markets flare up. They don't have to flare up much to produce, a, you know, an increase in homicide. Um, so that, that, those are, I mean, we have to think very carefully about parsing out, in terms of time series analysis, parsing out the effects that operate in the short term versus the long term processes that are going on, as well as considering the possibility that whatever is affecting short term changes in crime can the impact of those factors can change over time. They're moderated by new technological conditions of safe firearms. Those points of our analysis. That's it. Okay.